Hi, everybody. It's Miss O'Connell. Um, if I sent you something before this video, disregard that because this is the video that you need. I'm playing around with how I'm getting content out and I want to make sure that this is working. So you see me in the little corner, hopefully, and then um, we're going to go over the third PowerPoint, which we didn't get a chance to get to today. So like I said, if something got sent to you, just delete it. Don't worry about it. Okay, so today we're going to look at European exploration and expansion. And when we look at this, we're going to look at a lot of the changes that are occurring within the 15th century to kind of make Europeans look outward. And this is everything that we're talking to up until this point is leading up to the American Revolution, okay? It's leading up to America becoming its own country. So changes in the 15th century. The first one is technological change. So think about all of the technology that we take for granted. Um, it's huge, right? So at this time, you are going to have technological change, but it's not going to be changed, obviously, like we have in 2020. So things like maritime technology, whenever we talk about maritime, we're talking about um, the water, the ocean, boats, things like that. So we're going to have navigational devices, things like compasses and astrolabes. Um, compasses, you know, we don't use anymore, unless you're going camping, maybe old school. But we all have apps on our phone that tell us where exactly where we need to go. And so it's not necessary to have things like a compass. Shipbuilding that make things faster and safer. Military technology like gunpowder and cannons. And navies really start to pop up at this time after 1450 um, because people wanted to trade safely, but also people wanted to protect their waters and um, their product while they were on the waters. So information technology, uh, printing, you know, before the 15th century, a lot of people couldn't read. So books were really expensive and only the wealthy could afford them because those were the ones who could read. Those are the ones who had the education. But in 1450, a man by the name of Johannes Gutenberg is going to invent the movable type, and that is going to allow for more books to be printed a lot easier, a lot faster, and it's going to combat what's known as localism, okay, which is kind of starting to get rid of that nobility and gentry, but, you know, making things like books a lot more adaptable and um, readily available to your average everyday person. So knowledge of the world is easier to obtain. With that printing press, you're going to start to see newspapers. You're going to start to see news being printed. But it also is going to allow and open the floodgates for a lot of gossip to be spread in small towns and cities. Um, and so it, it's good and bad. Uh, other technological change. Marco Polo. He is going to travel to China between 1274 and 1295. And there's a book called The Travels of Marco Polo, and it was published in 1477. And when people started to read this, it really made a lot of people um, become a little bit more interested in trade and what new products were out there because, you know, people were pigeonholed where they were living. They didn't have the opportunity to um, get out a lot. I mean, there were no planes or anything like that. People really didn't travel for leisure. Um, and so people read about Marco Polo and his, you know, adventures, and they were intrigued by that. So the Europe was not necessarily ahead of the world technologically. Um, you know, mathematics, they are going to come from the Muslim world and astronomy and gunpowder in China. So we tend to think of Europe, you know, with especially with like the Industrial Revolution being the leader, and they were. But we got a lot of things from not only the Middle East, but from Asia as well. So here's an example of one of the very first books that was printed on that Gutenberg printing press. So you can see a lot different from what we have today. Um, and there is an interpretation of Marco Polo. And again, there is some um, depictions of early maps and things like that of his travels. All right. So as far as political change went, uh, nation states are going to develop around 1400. So we're going to have areas like Spain and Portugal. And within those areas, we're going to have the centralization of authority. Um, so there's going to be a law. There's going to be um, a group of leaders set up at this time. We're going to have the administration of taxes. So people are going to have to pay money to live where they're living. There's going to be a military um, and there's going to be an economy that's very efficient. So a lot of times, at the, a lot of... Um, a lot of times at this time in history, 
countries are going to find out what they're really good at developing, and they're going to stick to that because you become a master of that, and then you have a commodity that everybody is going to want, and you can either trade or buy for other things that you need. So coordination of efforts and resources a lot of times makes larger projects and risks, um, you know, expanding. It made it possible for countries to expand at this time. And there's going to be a lot of political influence on merchants, capitalists, um, and people are going to recognize the potential of trade. So they're going to want to get their foot in the door. They're going to want to be able to um, have an interest and make some money because that was it, what it was all about at this time. So coordination and cooperation. We're going to have what's known as the Hanseatic League in Germany. And this Hanseatic League was a partnership between merchants and the state for mutual benefit. So basically, um, they wanted to make sure that everyone was going to have access for trade, for capitalism, and it is going to occur in Northwest and Central Europe. I'm going to actually show you a map of that Hanseatic League. So here you go. Um, the trade that was occurring at the time. You can see a lot of the circles and the squares are your chief cities. Um, you can see that it uh, looks like a star or a circle with a square is an important city that was used for trade. Um, and you can kind of see where everything was spread out. You know, the, the Saxony, Prussia, Sweden, the Rhineland, places like that. So this is where trade was going to kind of start around the 13th to 17th centuries. All right. Economic change was also occurring at this time. Spain and Portugal are going to begin to exploit a lot of their opportunities. Portugal is going to start to explore the African coast and the Atlantic Islands to kind of see what was out there. And the Portuguese routes are in blue, so you can kind of see where they were going um, you know, they're going to start up in Portugal, go all the way down to West Africa. They're going to kind of circumnavigate there um, and see what was available to them. Then you have uh, Prince Henry the Navigator, who's going to lead this charge. He's going to expand European knowledge of Africa and see what was in Africa, okay? And what he's going to find ultimately will be the slavery issue, and that will bring slaves um, to, to this area. Spain is going to sponsor voyages of discovery. So they are going to establish colonies in the New World as, again, uh, as well. So you can see the trade routes um, that are going to be set up at this time are in red. So Hernando Cortez um, is going to deal with the Aztecs in Mexico and Fr Francisco Pizarro with the Incas in Peru. Okay, so... New Spain um, is kind of a victim of its own success. So the Spanish colonies at this time are going to produce vast amounts of gold and silver. They're going to have regular shipments to Spain that encourage a lot of piracy. Okay, so Francis Drake, John Hawkins. And obviously, when you think about piracy, um, you think about, you know, kind of hardcore doing what you need to do, taking what you want to take, and not worrying about what your, who your victims may be. So a lot of the Spanish gold that was spent in New Europe finances exploration uh, by England, France, and the Netherlands. And the economic center of Europe is going to shift from the Mediterranean to northern Europe. Okay, so no longer are we worried about, you know, it's, it's, we move away from the water to northern parts of Europe. And if it seems like I'm going through this quickly, I want you to know that History 1250 is a survey course. So we're really not meant to spend a ton of time on one specific or two specific topics. I mean, we might spend a little bit more time on a few things, but it's just to kind of give you an overview, not to get too in-depth with things, okay? But if you have questions, always email me. Always, when we meet in virtual chat, let me know. All right, we're also going to see a lot of religious change at this time. So we're going to have the Protestant Reformation in the early 16th century with Martin Luther, and Martin Luther was kind of a rebel rouser, okay? Martin Luther is going to be the one who nails his 95 theses up to the church door and is excommunicated. We're also going to have John Calvin and Henry VIII. Um, we're going to have the Puritans, which if you're a junior, you had a lot of, you talked about Puritans last year. And if you're going to be a junior this year, I know that you talk about Puritans this year. Their sect is going to emerge in 1566. And there's going to be a lot of increased interest in and competition for liberty 
to practice religion without persecution. Okay, because a lot of times countries, you know, we talk about why a lot of people came to the United States ultimately is because of religious persecution. And supposedly the United States had religious freedom here. Um, but, and this is exactly what was happening is that people were saying that, you know what, you have to practice this religion or this religion or else you could be persecuted for your beliefs. Okay, and here you have an interpretation of Martin Luther hanging, hanging his 95 theses to the wall. You have John Calvin and you have Henry VIII. So Henry VIII is one of my favorite people because he was not like, he was married eight times, okay? So I don't know if you covered that in world history, but I wrote a term paper on this when I was a senior in high school. I don't know why I remember. But the old saying goes with Henry VIII's six wives, divorce, beheaded, died, divorce, beheaded, survived. So he was married to Catherine of Aragon. He had Mary as a daughter. Then he cheated on her and wanted to get a divorce, but the Catholic Church would not allow him to get a divorce. So he went and he created his own church, the Anglican Church or the Church of England. So then he married Anne Boleyn, who rumor has it she only had nine fingers and she was a witch. Um, and Anne Boleyn gave him another daughter, Elizabeth I. Um, but then he had her beheaded and... He married Jane Seymour, who supposedly was the love of his life, uh, but she died after giving birth. And this was all a quest to have a, a male heir, basically, okay? And he never got one. Um, and then he was married. I'm trying to remember who, how it goes. There's two Catherines, Catherine Howard, Catherine Parr, and I can't remember for the life of me um, the other one. But anyways, within his last three wives, another died. He had another beheaded and then one survived and outlived him. So we think of Henry VIII though with Elizabeth I. Um, she was the Queen of England for a long period of time. All right. So other intellectual change that occurs at this time is the Renaissance. So Renaissance just means a rebirth. Um, and it was a lot of Greek and Roman learning that was going on at this time. The emergence of humanism, uh, this idea of artistic and literary flowering, um, a lot of paintings that were created during the Renaissance, very artsy. It showed the woman's form. Um, it showed, you know, a lot of realism, things like that. Then we have the scientific revolution, which you should be a little bit familiar with. So this really unsettles the world view of religion, okay? We shift from, you know what, why are we believing in religion. We can't prove religion, but we can prove science. So it leads up to the Enlightenment, okay? So Nicholas Copernicus, um, who stated that the sun was at the center of the earth. Um, Galileo, who was um, put into prison because of his beliefs. Um, so here are some examples of Renaissance paintings, and you can kind of see a lot of angels, a lot of rebirth, a lot of all that stuff. Um, so, you know, we move away from this idea of divine right of kings that, you know, the king is spoken to by God. And a lot of people started thinking, what? No, that's not, that's not something that happens. Um, so prove to me that the, the God is talking to this king. Okay. Make me believe it. So a lot of people started to question things and wanted reason and science to kind of pull that all together. All right. Um, so all these changes are going to expand um, Europe, okay? So Europe is going to start to grow and expand at this time. There's a lot of new imaginative and intellectual possibilities. Gold, God, and glory, okay, was what, you know, a lot of people believed Europe had to offer at this time. So it's at this time that we start to see a lot of competition among nations um, start to emerge. And what was happening is that these prominent nations, England, France, Germany, or Prussia at the time, wanted to control areas in Africa. They wanted to control areas in Europe, okay, because they wanted to establish new colonies, and that America is one of those areas. There's huge economic rewards, this risk of being left behind. You don't want to be left behind while everyone else is out there, and they are uh, making strides. And there are four major avenues of expansion at this time. So commercial expansion, selling, you know, being able to sell your products worldwide at the time. 
Conquest, wanting to take over others and spread your ideas and beliefs. The idea of slavery, which we will get into next week. And colonies, settling, having settlement colonies and being able to exert your power over those colonies to expand your own area. So commercial expansion, we're going to look at mercantilism. So mercantilism um, really puts an importance on precious metals. So the idea of this kind of fixed amount of wealth, you want to maximize your exports over your imports. You always want to be exporting more than you import because that means you're making more money. Opening new trade routes, okay, so Columbus is going to wind up searching for a route to India. And this idea of wanting to control the seas, okay? People wanted access to resources, and various countries wanted to be able to say, you have to go through me to be able to get that. As far as conquest goes, Spain and Portugal are going to kind of pioneer this idea of conquest, and they're going to have a lot of success through better technology, exploiting a lot of internal divisions among other countries. So if other country groups were arguing with one another, they would exploit that. Uh, susceptibility to disease, they were less susceptible to disease than other European countries. And the conquerors at this time, um, at the top of new societies, the popula populations were made up of indigenous people, okay? So they were going to have more say over those individuals um, through Spain and Portugal than other countries. And they're also going to use labor to extract natural resources. So they were going to put people to work. All right, then we have slavery. And like I said, we're going to get into slavery much more next week. But the Portuguese are going to have trade alliances in Africa, okay? And uh, what they stumble upon is the African slave trade of slaves coming, not necessarily wanting to come to the New World because that wasn't the case. A lot of times you're going to read an article next week where a slave was just taken from, or an Af a African was taken from his home, put on a boat, and told that he was coming here and had no say in it. You know, a lot of um, Africans who were taken from their homes like that wound up jumping off the boats and committing suicide because they knew what awaited them and they didn't want that. Um, so a lot of enslaved Africans were used on Brazilian sugar plantations. And later, other European powers start to begin slave trading, and that is when it really explodes. And slaves were huge in British North America because think about North America, that's where the United States is now, but think about we had we had farms, we had plantations, we needed, um, or the United States needed, you know, manual labor to do that. And so that's why slaves were important at the time. All right, settlement colonies, the Europeans um, are the basis of a new society. So it's going to be, these new colonies are going to be promoted by merchants and populated by pre-industrial people. So still this idea of agriculture. The Dutch, okay, their bases are going to start to raid a lot of Spanish shipping. We're going to have the creation of the West Indies and New Amsterdam. They're going to create a very lucrative sugar economy. But in the 1660s, the English drive the Dutch out. And so New Amsterdam becomes New York. So it would be really interesting if the Dutch had stayed, you know, what, what, our, what our country would kind of look like. So there's so many different things that could have changed the course of history. So then we have Canada. So Canada is obviously to the top of us. And Canada was run by the French by a mercantile company until the 1660s. Um, They're going to pursue fur trade with the help of indigenous people. So the fur trade was a huge commodity at this time. And it was done in a lot of areas that are now the United States and that are now Canada. So there's a really good movie. I don't know if you've ever seen it. I usually show it, but we won't have time this year. It's called The Revenant, and it's about the fur trade. So if you ever get a chance to watch that, you totally should because it gives you a good idea of what people were willing to do for these fur pelts that were worth lots and lots of money. Uh, French Canada becomes a government province after 1660. So then we have British North America. Uh, we had varied motives for settlement. Uh, religious toleration was a huge one. The commercial, you know, idea that we could get... Um, we could start to sell new product. We're going to look at tobacco. We're going to look at cotton. All of these things are going to start to come up with um, the idea of this British North America and availability of land. So it was a new place for people to settle, kind of wide open spaces in a way. So as you can see, um, the cr 
chronology of European colonies in the Americas. So you can kind of see it starts off with New Spain, Portuguese, then we go to France, Virginia, Plymouth, Maryland, Connecticut, those states that we are now more familiar with. And then here are European colonies, and these are circa around 1760, circa means around 1763. So everything that was in pink, the British were in control of, okay? It's really interesting because um, the United States at the time was pretty, you know, it was British and French. Those were the two countries that, that really um, are going to take off. So and there's going to be a war that's fought over that, the French and Indian War, which we will talk to uh, talk about as well. Okay, so Spain a little bit, but that's more the Mexico area. Um, so it's really just France and Great Britain that are going to control what is the United States today. Okay, so that ends our slideshow. If you have questions, please let me know. Um, I am always here to answer them. Uh, but you really do need to watch this and fill in your notes because this will be on your quiz next week. Okay? All right. Have a great weekend, and I will see you all on Tuesday.